fantastic. So, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to what I think is the fifth of our events uh, for City Entrepreneur Network. We are part of uh, City University of London and we have three fantastic panelists here today. Um, I think you are all muted and uh, off video anyway, which is great, but if you can just make sure uh, so we don't get any like rogue background noises, uh, that would be fantastic. So today's session is going to be talking about uh, founders, accelerators and funding, and we're going to spend about 35, 40 minutes uh, talking about like panel questions first and then we're going to open up to audience questions as well so anytime you think of a question just put it in the chat uh, I know some of you posted questions quite a few of you posted questions in your RSVP so thank you for those already we'll get around to those and uh, yeah anytime you're inspired by something that's that's being discussed then feel free to uh, just put that in the chat we'll get through as as many as we can so with me today is Honor and Claudia. Uh, we are part of the City Entrepreneur Network Committee and they're really gonna be asking the majority of the questions. I'm just gonna ask one, one or two every now and again. Uh, so before we start diving in, it's probably, probably useful to know who you're actually with today. So uh, let's start with intros. Uh, in no particular order, um, well, Let's go alpha because it's easier. Um, Adam, do you want to kick things off? That's the great thing about my name. I'm always always first in an alpha order. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Adam Gordon. Um, I'm the CEO of Plum.1. It's a new search engine um, just launched in March. Um, I am a serial entrepreneur and also a serial marketer. I'm also the fractional CMO of a number of startups. Um, and I do a lot of advising on startups, angel investing, um, getting companies on their business model, on their story, which is really what I concentrate on more than anything, is helping companies tell a great story, because the better you tell your story, the more successful you'll be. And um, my search engine is Plum.1, P-L-U-M-B dot O-N-E. Please go try it. I'm the CEO. I have to sell it. Um, and um, it's by far and away the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. It's helped out a bunch of people already, and it's amazing to watch this move forward every day on a daily basis. It drives me out of bed. And like I said, it's the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. That's what entrepreneurship should all be about. Doing something should you love. Be. Should be. <laughs> Always, but should be. I agree. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Um, AP, do you want to go? Hi, I'm AP. Um, I like to call myself a creative entrepreneur. Um, I've always sort of been in the creative space. I started my career in um, hospitality design and then moved into experiential retail design and sort of pop-up design and how do you really create that brand experience in an experiential way. Um, I co-founded a museum called Arcadia Earth, um, which is like a multi-sensorial uh, museum in New York, um, talking about sustainability. Um, I'm currently the CEO of Denim Rush. We do all hand-painted pieces and really create this. We just want to make the world more comfy and colorful. Um, and I am currently working on a company called Musey to help um, people get more access to artwork without breaking their bank or wanting to shoot themselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's hard to follow that up. Um, my name is Rahul Brambat. I'm calling you guys from Houston, Texas. Uh, very sexy Houston, Texas. Um, I am the co-founder of Day One. It's an early stage community of fellowships and programs for a kind of the stage of entrepreneur and founder that I think isn't focused on that much, which is kind of exploring, refining, and accelerating before you get to that accelerator. Um, I am a serial career hopper. I've worked for about 20 years. I started out in oil and gas engineering. Fantastic experience, got to live all over the world, Hong Kong, Turkey, China, Shanghai, Beijing, did that for a couple of years. Then realized at the ripe old age of 28, I hated my job and hated what I did. So I started over, went back to school and really went the other way. I started focusing a lot on education and youth and children. And I did about two years of nonprofit service delivery work in the US and in rural India fell in love with the people and the mission and the causes that I was kind of fighting for and championing, 
So I spent probably the next decade or so back in the US setting up US fundraising entities for African and Indian nonprofits, primarily working on girls' education. You know, learn from the beginning. I didn't have the qualifications necessarily to have this role, but I just kind of learned on the job. Ended up raising around 20 million bucks in the process for three or four different organizations. And I got bored again after about seven, eight years of doing that. In the last three, four years, I've really been in the startup space, advising, mentoring, and investing in early stage startups, supporting founders, just really anything from super tactical advice to just being a shoulder people can lean on and commiserating about how difficult and kind of non-linear this journey can be. Um, and we'll obviously get into details later, but as part of that last three, four years, I joined a couple of kind of early stage founder programs, uh, generally kind of put on by VCs and realized that the customer experience for that was great if you ended up having an investable business idea within the first couple of weeks. But if you didn't, it was a pretty bad experience and you left demoralized and upset and felt like a failure. And it's really, I realized after talking to hundreds of people, you only felt like that because it was through the lens that those VCs wanted to look at you through. So that's why we started day one and excited to kind of share some of those insights and learnings with you guys in the next hour and a half. Very nice, super interesting. Uh, thank you guys for your introduction. Um, we would probably go ahead with the very, very uh, basic of entrepreneurship. Um, how did you come up with your idea? That would be our main first question. Um, how how did you really how did you think of it? When did it come up? And how did you go from thinking about it to actually doing it, um, putting it out there? Um, yeah. Whoever wants to go first, shoot. <laughs> um, I'm happy to. I seem to be always the guy who does that. Um, so uh, Plum exists because of a confluence of um, a vision, um, some people, some time, some technology, some money, and some will. Um, uh, a friend of mine, as the output of his very successful SEO company, had an independent index of the internet. We were talking about how to monetize that because it's a really valuable piece of digital real estate. Um, and I had been thinking about search for a long time. And so we started thinking about that. And he said, you should talk to my friend because he talks a lot like you do. And he's been now my co-founder. So um, it was really a confluence of this ideas and some technology. Um, we talked, Steve and I talked about it for maybe a year, talking about how to do it. And I was attempting to model the company and, and model what the financial part of it would look like, which turned out to be impossible without actually running it. Um, so we put it up. Uh, we put it up in March. Um, uh, the last half of March, we served about 70 searches a day at the moment. As of a couple of days ago, we were searching 700. We were serving 700 searches a day, um, but it really was this confluence of pieces in the world that really all came together. And uh, you know, it, you might call it luck. Um, it certainly was lucky that all of those pieces were there. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But really, it was more the will of the participants that really brought it all together and made it go. Um, so I'd been wanting to make search better. I'd been bemoaning about Google and everything else for a long time. And this just, it was like the world just presented this to me on a plate. All of these things came together that enabled me to actually do something about it. Um, and it's an amazing experience because I don't feel like I'm, you know, macheting my way through the forest, causing a path for myself to be there. It's much more like I'm surfing a wave and the world is driving me forward to do this. And it's a truly amazing experience. Go for it, AP. Okay. <laughs> um, so when, I think for me, how it all started was my whole background has been in experiences. So after sort of designing this museum and this experience where um, we were really just changing the way people felt um, throughout the whole, you know, journey, um, I figured, you know what, I should do this for myself. And um, as, as I was a founding partner, it still was, didn't feel like it was like my baby or my idea. Um, so Denim Rush 
initially was a um, event company where we would work with um, brands like Bloomingdale's or bigger brick and mortar spaces and kind of create this in-person um, experience to drive traffic through um, their stores. And so that's what it was until COVID hit. And so co like March was supposed to be like our biggest month. We were gonna work with Jay Balvin. It was gonna be really cool. And then it all just like went down the gutter. Um, so we really had to pivot into becoming this e-commerce um, platforms, which has been, you know, kind of great to learn during COVID. Um, and so with all of that, a big part of it was how do you create an online experience as well? Um, you know, now even all brick and mortar sort of stores are pivoting to online. And after COVID, we've all learned that online experience, you know, now it's going to happen, same thing's going to happen where we have an over flooded online experience, but like, how are you really touching and engaging with your customers? Um, so that's how Down and Rush started. And then my whole concept for Musi is that as a designer and as working with people, um, art's always a big pain in the ass that everyone wants, but no one can afford or it's confusing. No one really knows what to do. Um, so I've, you know, kind of used all of my, everything that I've worked on in interior design, art experience, like e-commerce. And I'm trying to converge everything into my next venture, um, which is Musi to help people kind of create this amazing online experience and get a really awesome one of a kind piece without, um, you know, breaking their bank or, you know, like being super hassle-free and like affordable. So, you know, how did I come up with this idea? Full disclosure, I didn't come up with it fully, but a little bit of backstory, like I mentioned earlier, I've done a bunch of different things. I'm a relatively smart guy. And about five or six years ago, I got pretty disillusioned with the nonprofit space, like the power dynamics around it, some of the business models that you're kind of tied to. And I had kind of been testing the waters on like, how do I take some of these skill sets that I have and extend them out? And so many people told me that, you know, tech and startup is, a, is, a, is, is an area you should look into because, you know, you can fundraise, you can do enterprise sales, you can run teams, yada, yada, yada. And so I tried and I realized everyone rejected me because I didn't have any of the signals that folks look for, right? I'm not Stanford, MIT. I'm not a technical person. I haven't built numbers of organizations in before. And so I was pretty depressed for a while. I was like, well, everyone keeps saying, Rahul, you're perfect for these roles. And I can't even get a first interview with any of these places. And I know the hiring manager, right? So it's tough. And so I thought to myself, well, let me, let me, let me take one of these boot camps, right? Let me do one of these eight to 10 week programs for early stage founders that show you all the stuff and the yada, yada, yada. And I did two or three of these. And like I mentioned, um, it was eye opening. It was very eye opening to realize that one, a lot of these programs kind of um, put time constraints on things. Like there was a lot of like meet your co-founder in eight weeks or launch your prototype in 10 weeks. And I thought to myself, that's fantastic. That's a great sales pitch. Let me do this thing. What I learned in all these programs is though you were in the room with people who had done it before, right? You weren't, all, it wasn't always just first time folks. And the way these programs were designed, were really designed around speed. It's getting to this point in a certain amount of time. And it ends up being a little of survival of the fittest. And so if you ended up being one of these, these kind of good teams, you had a fantastic experience. And I just got kind of in my emotions for a bit. And I ended up starting to talk to people in my program and some of the other programs. So last summer, I ended up, I had a spreadsheet. I talked to probably 200 people in programs like this, these eight week virtual boot camps, And I realized that across the board, everybody said I would pay money if I could be treated like a student in one of these things where it wasn't just my business idea that was being vetted. It was just me as a founder and the skills that I needed to, to, to kind of get stronger on. So that's, that's the kind of regular part of the story. The next part, you guys are all going to laugh at a little bit, especially AP, Adam and Tori. And so one of the people I met who rejected me a year and a half ago was this guy named Andrew Hutton at human ventures. He said, you're a great guy, sharp dude, but you don't really have a business idea. You haven't really validated anything. We'll have to pass on you. He ran a venture studio called Human Ventures where they get a thousand applications a quarter and they pick a dozen founders that are kind of pretty later stage to like really focus on. Anyway, I'm annoyed last summer. I see Andrew on LinkedIn and he posts, I'm launching this thing called Day One for early stage founders. I was the fifth applicant. So I actually applied to be in the first cohort I followed up with an email 
to say, hey, I'm actually a good customer. You and I talked a while back. I've been in a number of programs. I think I might have some insights for you on what I've experienced with other products out there. If you'd be interested in getting on a call, I'd love to hop on the phone with you. He took me up on the offer. One call led to two, led to three, led to four. And six weeks later, I became one of the co-founders of day one. So again, it, it's, um, I just kind of stumbled upon this. It's not like I had a master plan to be like, I'm going to build this program. I was just a really frustrated customer. I happened to in the right place in the right time had built meaningful relationships in the past that I could leverage when the time came for me to say, wait, maybe I could activate one of these relationships. That's super interesting. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, our next question would have been, what advice can you give to entrepreneurs who are yet to find their big ideas? But I think we kind of answered that already impartially um, by being very open, taking every opportunity, reaching out to people. Um, is there any key element that you guys have maybe? Any, anything that's specifically the one thing that helped you? They really engage with life and notice everything because there's tons of business opportunities out there. If you're thinking about business opportunities, I think you're thinking about the wrong thing. Stay engaged with life and stay aware and stay awake. Talk to as many people as you can. There's tons of issues out there that we can solve. I, to add to that point, I think the biggest challenge for me is like, I definitely became, was an accidental entrepreneur and now I'm like going with the flow essentially. Um, but the biggest like sort of frustration point um, in the whole thing was not being able to be resilient and also like not looking at it from a point of curiosity rather than like anger mm -hmm. or like your ego sort of just being hurt. Because at the end of the day, like, like I always say like, my favorite cartoon character is Dory because she forgets everything all the time. And she's forget, she's forget, she forgets that she's fearful, you know, that what she's scared of. Um, and I think that you're going to get knocked down all the time. So like, don't be so attached to like one thing, really, really see what's out there and see like, if you are the right person to do that, because a lot of times we feel so strongly about certain things, but like, you know, I come up with ideas every day, but like, I'm not the right person to like execute these ideas or like, you know, talk about um, all of that, but really looking at it from a point of curiosity rather than anger and frustration, like will literally be so good for your mental health. <laughs> and like, you know, it'll make the process a lot more like enjoyable rather than, you know, giving up really fast. Yep. That's a great um, answer. AP, that's a great answer. I like that a lot. Um, I've got two. The first one, I'm pretty sure AP and Toy are going to roll their eyes because they hear me say this like a dozen times a week to them. But be obsessed with the problem and not obsessed with your solution. Um, in the course of being an entrepreneur, you hear things like pivot. You know, pivots aren't these like epiphany moments where it just becomes super crystal clear. Oh, my God, I have to pivot. It's a continuation of these conversations, tens and dozens and hundreds of conversations. So you know, be obsessed with the problem and solving problems. You know, one of the things I say is for a product solution or a company to work, you've got to be able, you know, there's kind of three elements to it. Um, will people use it? Can you build it? And will people pay for it? What I found is people tend to over index on the, can you build it? And will people pay for it? And they kind of gloss over the part of like, will people actually use this thing? So if you're focused on the problem and solving problems and less on your solution, um, that's kind of the one piece of advice. And the other one is entrepreneurship's hard. So don't create additional constraints for yourself. Don't put crazy timelines for things because you see or read somewhere. Don't kind of quit your job and take a leap of faith because blogs tell you and VCs tell you like, I need to see that you're all in. Like there's elements of this journey that are fast and there's elements and parts that are slow. Don't add pressure and stress to what's already going to be a stressful situation by creating and adding additional constraints in your life. That's kind of my two pieces. And if I could just add on to that, I think Rahul just made a great point. There's a ton of stuff out there, medium, uh, you know, entrepreneur.com. There's tons of stuff out there. Don't believe any of it. Um, you know, take it all with at least five grains of salt because your situation is unique. And just like any medicine that a doctor gives you is going to work uniquely in your body, your business situation and your personality are unique. And you need to do stuff that works for you because 
because Elon Musk does something doesn't mean squat and whether it's going to actually work for you or not. I literally, when I first was like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur full time, I would listen to all the podcasts and, you know, how I built this and everything. And I used to have routine panic attacks at three o'clock in the morning because I was like, <laughs> why am I not like, I, I had to stop listening to them because it was all just this idealistic view of what entrepreneurship is. And like, no one talks about like, it's hard. It's really hard. You really truly have to believe in it, in your soul and like in your, literally your insides because people are going to say no to you every day. And so when you are thinking about your big idea or what you're going to do, like you're going to be spending like probably the rest of your life trying to figure that out. So like really think about and consider like, is this something that I am really passionate about or a problem that I really, really, really care about um, that I want to solve? So like you don't have routine panic attacks like I do, you know? I, I love that. I mean, so many great areas to to dig into there and actually it sort of segues really well to you know the the next question I was going to ask because everybody's always thinking entrepreneurship is so glam and it's so sexy and like yes I really really want to go into it because you know I'm going to make billions I'm going to be this unicorn but like you might be like really you know dedicated to try and solve your your problem but it doesn't mean you've got all of the tools necessary to help you do that and achieve it and to run your businesses so I'd be curious to hear you know as you've been going through this um you know what have been like the the biggest challenges that you found yourself facing sort of time and time again and like when it comes time to trying to solve them knowing that you know you have to do it for yourself and you can't go following Elon Musk like how do you like what resources what specifically have you guys done to try and solve the problems that you've encountered rather than just you know reading everything and, and hoping that you know just by reading article after article after article you might be able to get there any are there any specific tactics that you've used i for me personally i thought that i needed to like change the world when I was like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, but like realizing that, you know, small businesses and all these other concepts are, they're still all entrepreneurs and you're still all like doing business and you're still all like affecting someone in like your life. Um, but the biggest thing for me was really just tapping into my network. Like I know what I'm literally just not good at and like what, like I can't do finance, like mm, not happening. Like, I just can't do it. So like, and like certain strategies and like the biggest part for me was really just talking to my network and really wanting to learn from them. People want to talk, people want to share what they know. People love that. And I think if you really, really take advantage of, you know, people that you've met and um, talk to more people rather than just reading articles and really just listening to what people, other people have to say, um, it might help you articulate your thoughts better in your head to help you solve, you're, you could solve the problem yourself. You just aren't having a hard time articulating what's going on in your head. Um, so the more conversations I feel like that you have with you know the network that you guys are already building and working on, um, people wanna help. So you just have to like, you have to lean in. So for me, um, you know, and I just had one of the mentors in day one tell me that I don't, pardon my French, fucking know what I'm doing. And I have absolutely no pro no, no chance of succeeding whatsoever. And I should just stop it now. And the only reason I was able to stand in that and respond to it in a, such a way that he and I both left that conversation, I think with a lot of understanding and respect for each other, comes down to a word that in my life I've realized is really important. And having been a total cynic for most of my life, I'm absolutely surprised that this is the word, but the word is faith. You got to have faith. If you have faith, you can overcome anything. Once you lose it, everything is hard. Um, I, you know, I have faith every day. I'm getting up and Plum is going to take another step or three or seven or two, one and a half, whatever, in the right direction. Um, and that's what drives me every day. Um, and that's why I'm able to stand in the face of somebody that I respect a lot telling me I'm full of shit and both of us coming away saying, well, OK, maybe not. Um, and really, that's what it is. One of the other thing, um, AP, I think, made a great point before that applies to this as well. Don't get angry. All it does is it sucks your soul away. Um, anytime you're operating out of anger, you're probably making a mistake. 
Um, you got to calm down, slow down a little bit, have faith in yourself and really look at what the issue is. Um, I wrote an article about this in, on Medium a couple of months ago. And the, uh, I have a question that I ask myself whenever that stuff gets really intense. And that question is, how do I use this? Um, it's so it stops being about my emotions and it stops being about whatever else is making me nuts and having me lose faith. But how do I use it? It gets me out of my head, gets my forebrain thinking more than my limbic system. And um, it puts me back into that space of faith. And it's a strange word for me to have come up with this late in life. But I really believe that's what it takes. Cool. Um, oh, Tori, you want to go? No, I was just saying, have faith, repeating what he said. Have faith, yeah. Um, so I've got two things, and then I guess two kind of ways I try to address them. One is like, this thing's lonely. It's confusing. It's not linear. I mean, those of us that, I don't want to speak for everybody's, but at least for my life, like everything's been linear. Like you go to middle school, then you go to high school, then you go to college, you pick what you want to do. If you want to be a doctor, like everything's laid out for you. All you got to do is not fail a test. If you want to get an internship, you probably have a job. Like the level of risk that we're actually able to deal with is not very high. Like we're, we're, we really freak out when we don't know what's next. And is it worth investing the next marginal dollar or hour into something else? And so it's confusing. It's nonlinear. That part freaks me out. And the other piece that actually is really tactical is like the opportunity cost. Like anytime I see a job wreck or somebody, hey man, this job would be perfect for you. Like that thing of just being like, man, I could just take this interview, make, make money again. Like what keeps me doing this when I'm like imposter syndrome, feeling lonely, feeling confused, not knowing what to do next. And then also just being like, there's literally a job there that could pay me like what I used to get paid. And I think it's a little bit of what AP said it's around, like, it's the people. It's really the people I'm around. And there's two things about that. Like, yeah, there's books and blogs and medium posts, but that tends to be one-way communication. And talk more times than not is pretty cheap. People will say and write whatever they think looks and feels cool. In reality, if you can build a group of people around you that are vulnerable, that are real, where you can sit and talk about all the business stuff, but also the crappy parts of it as well, that that helps me like talking to people and really like, man, I just got rejected by 10 investors or whatever. And I think to that point, the one thing I do want to say is I think a big mistake folks make and a piece of advice, if I could give some is we tend to like in the people and networks we keep around us almost be too strategic. Like if I'm a domain expert and I'm not technical, we tend to say, my God, I need to meet 20 technical people. And like, that's the only people you want to talk to where it's like, oh, if I talk to another nonprofit guy, it's like redundancy and like, forget that. I think we over index on IQ way too much in early stage entrepreneurship. It's different if you're, you know, series C and whatever, and you need a specific thing, but just meet people that get you oh, under index on IQ because that stuff's going to come to you anyway, over index on EQ, people that have humility, that have compassion, that can resonate with you, that are vulnerable, that'll share stories. If you just end up being with a bunch of programmers because that's what you need in your business, you're not going to get what you need out of your relationship. So that's my big one takeaway and one piece of advice. Go ahead, AB. Okay. Nope. Um, nope. So nope. The, the way I do marketing is I'm a storyteller. That's how I describe myself. What I've discovered is that I have yet to meet anybody who doesn't have a story that can teach me something. So because you think somebody's a homeless bum or because they're elon musk and you think they're too brilliant to talk to they all have stories and they'll all teach you something and so you're looking for a technical co-founder go talk to non-technical people because they know technical people you're looking for a finance person go talk to non-finance people because they know finance people everybody's story has something to teach you and as a entrepreneur you need to be listening to as many of those as you can a bunch of them you'll filter out there's always a lot of chaff and a little bit of wheat but everybody's story has at least a one nugget of gold for you. And then just to add my like one big thing that has helped me in the last year is um, knowing that A, no one knows what they're doing. So like, calm down, <laughs> it's true. all good. Like no one literally knows what they're doing, but B, making, you have to like kind of learn to like thrive in chaos, right? Like you're making 100% of the decisions with like 2% of the knowledge or 2% of like, you know, what you have and like what really makes a difference is your conviction and making sure and you really want to make, make 
you really want to make it happen. But it's really hard to make decisions when you're like, I don't really know, like, exactly what I'm doing. I don't really know, <laughs> like, you know, like, what is going on? Um, and then you look at everyone else and I'm like, oh, man, they really know what's going on, you know? No, I've had people who now intern for me from the outset be like, damn, you really knew what you were doing with Dannermush. And they join, I'm like, they're like, wait, what? And I was like, I'm telling you, it's all a facade. Like, no, no one really knows what's going on. Um, and you just have to really get comfortable with like making decisions with not having all the information and kind of like, again, turning that lens of curiosity on and kind of being like, I want to test this and I want to test that and just being like, all right, well, you're kind of like a scientist, just testing a bunch of things and hoping that something sticks essentially. Imposter syndrome is bullshit. Okay. Everybody's got it and people do stuff anyway. Don't let it stop you. Not, not that it's bullshit like it doesn't exist. It absolutely exists, but it's not a reason to not do something. That's, uh, that's very good. Uh, I think a lot of people have probably had this experience before as well. Um, AP, you just mentioned, or uh, you just said, getting things done. And once you start, uh, you know, you have to kind of get used to chaos. Um, but if you start, there's also, of course, the help that you can get from outsiders to you know, avoid chaos or have people talking to you that have experience with this uh, situation. So what are your guys or what are you guys thoughts on accelerators? Um, what value do they bring? When is the right time to join them? Um, and especially if you want to join them, how to choose them? What is the cost of equity, the prestige, the stage? Um, yeah, give us your thoughts on that. I don't know much about accelerators, but I will say that being in, for me, what makes me anxious or what where my chaos thrives is when I don't have knowledge. Um, and going into entrepreneurship, it's a lot of like, there's no really like area you're like, there's no guidebook, there's no area you're like Rahul said, you're kind of just, you're kind of like figuring it out and there's no like playbook that you can really go by. So for me, joining day one has been really just like, a, like a hit, like I'm in school and like that's so exciting because I'm like learning and there's like because I used to learn on TikTok and like I really don't think that that's really where you should get most of your information from I was on like the business side of TikTok and scrolling and I'm like who knows if this is accurate but someone's giving me information and I want to learn it um so and now and now how much dogecoin do you have really is <laughs> <laughs> I mean truly and like because like people everyone like everyone just comes up super like knowledgeable and like, you know, you just want to soak in as much information so that you get as many experiences to make a well-informed decision. And the more that you do it, the concept of chaos kind of changes and the concept of what that means to you and how you're like going about it changes. Um, but I feel like Rahul could speak more about accelerators. He has way more experience than I do on that. So accelerators are great. They're fantastic. But to take this metaphor, like even one step further, to accelerate, you already have to have velocity. And the problem is too many people who just have an idea and maybe a business plan on paper will apply to accelerators, right? And so you got to have velocity before you accelerate. And so keep that in mind. Accelerators are fantastic, but there's a specific use case for when and who should apply to them. And I think that's what the general public doesn't really understand. Think of an accelerator as Harvard Medical School, right? If anybody offered you admission to Harvard Medical School, you would take it, right? But if you didn't want to be a doctor, Harvard Medical School is going to be the biggest waste of your life, and you're going to be around a bunch of people who understand biology way better than you, right? So accelerators are great, one, after you have momentum, right? Momentum can be traction, can be product market fit, can be revenue, right? Can be any of these things. In specific cases for serial entrepreneurs that have the right signals, Stanford, Harvard, Google, whatever that is, they've had two exits or whatever, Accelerators will take you with just an idea on a sheet of paper. But for most first time or second time starting out entrepreneurs, they're gonna wanna see traction. And so what ends up happening is people have an idea, they talk to their mom and dad and 20 of their friends, not in the proper way. They're like, is this a good idea? Because people love you, they're not gonna crush your hopes and dreams. They're all gonna say yes. Next thing you know, you need to build something. You read some blog and they're like, well, go build this thing. And you're like, I don't know how to code. Somebody now tells you you need $100,000. Next thing you know, you have a pitch deck. And now you're trying to talk to investors, selling them on raising $100,000. And 
And investors are like, no, you haven't done any of the work. And human nature is not to say, maybe I should go back to the drawing board and fill in these gaps. It's I need to meet more investors. And now you go down this crazy rabbit hole where you end up spending time and money trying to find investors and you keep getting rejected to accelerators. So accelerators are great, but you need to have momentum and velocity before you get into them. The other thing that, that I think I didn't realize until I kind of got closer to the game about three or four years ago is as an entrepreneur, you need to be very clear. And sometimes it's hard to be clear when it's just a sheet of paper and an idea on whether you're interested in building a billion dollar VC backable rocket ship, or you just wanna build an awesome company that's five or 10 million bucks that employs 20 people that is great. Like if they call it a lifestyle business, in many ways that's a little disparaging, but build an awesome local business that supports your community, keeps your family good for the next two generations, or do you wanna build that billion dollar rocket ship? Because accelerators are more likely than not funded by venture capital funds. And they are programs designed to get more companies in front of their investors so that their investors can get their 10, 20, 30, 40 X. And so when you look at accelerators, they have demo days at the end, which are awesome. If that's what you're building and that's what you want to do and that's what you're ready for. But ultimately those programs more times than not will be reverse engineer to prepare you for what your demo day pitch needs to be for those investors in the audience. And so if you're totally comfortable building a $5 million business, which like, I'm not rich at all. So even saying a small $5 million business sounds crazy to me. Like if you're good with that, you're going to hit a lot of bumps when you apply to accelerators because they're going to want to hear the billion dollar story. So none of this stuff should, should make anybody change their mind of what they're thinking, but just do the research, read up on accelerators, the concept of them, what they're for, who they're serving. They're ultimately serving the investors in that VC fund to get more deals in front of them. Again, none of this is bad. If any of you are building an enterprise SaaS thing that's super scalable, that has a market, you know, a TAM of whatever, 50 billion, do the accelerator piece, but know what you're getting into. So don't, you know, you don't end up in Harvard Medical School when you actually want to be an advertising executive. And my take on that would be to um, think about the context and the content of where you are, the form and the structure. Most companies, most and entrepreneurs, I think, tend to focus too much on one or the other. So they're either too much thinking long-term or they're too much thinking short-term. You need to balance those. So if your long-term goal is to raise a, to create a $50 million company, in order to get there, your first step is going to be a million-dollar company or a $500,000 company. And unless you get to that step, you're never going to make it to the 50. So you want to think about what you need in your business to get to that 50, but you also need to think about what you need in that business to get to five or two or whatever that first number is. So um, when you, I find that when I start thinking like that, it really hones my listening for, for yes, this is the right program for me or no, this wasn't the right program for me. That's the reason I'm in day one because I felt like they were the right piece to get me to the next step that's going to allow me to take plum to be whatever it's going to be. It, it could end up being easily tens of millions of dollars of business in the next couple of years. But I'm not going to get there if I don't make it through March or June, sorry, um, forgetting where I am in the year. Um, so I think we tend to lose folk, we tend to lose balance. We tend to go to one extreme or the other. We're either really thinking long term and not paying enough attention to the short term, or we're thinking so short term that there's no long term. And when you do that, you end up skewing off in some direction that's just not the right one for what you want to do. So it's keeping aware of that dichotomy of being able to balance the long term thinking and the short term thinking. As a startup, you need to survive. But you also need to survive in a way that your long-term survival is also not guaranteed, but more assured. I think that that's that's a, gets lost a lot in thinking about what's the next thing to do. I think a part of that is also like being agile. So like, no one knew COVID was going to happen. No one knew like there's so many external factors that sort of play into your thing. So. It, it, like I always think it's hard for me of like I'm gonna make a five year term like I'm gonna make a goal like I'm sure like the taxi industry did that and had no idea Uber was gonna come and like screw the pooch and like now what you know what I mean and it's the, if you're not like an agile enough person or you know 
you're not like able to kind of still stick to your core, but really go as like your customers need, then it's just probably a lot of like unnecessary work. <laughs> I think that's a really good point. So thank you so much for the amazing insights. Um, to wrap this up, we have one last question concerning funding. So how did you initially fund your company and when and how would you consider outside fundraising? Do you have any tips and tricks? I'm both. So like, I, I think for me, funding is so like, I have never done that. Um, and also like, since I do have a creative company, like funding, I think is a lot harder because it's like, you're really sen selling something subjective in like a very objective way. Um, so for me, especially with Dan and Rush, like we've never taken a dollar from anyone. So it's been like, but I also think that because I did that, I like maybe understand the value of the dollar that I'm spending a little bit more rather than like just taking money that I'm getting, like, I, or I potentially could get and be like, I have money, like I have time to explore this, but like, did you really need to explore that? Like, I don't know. You, I feel like you wouldn't really know that unless you like really knew the value of the dollar when it's your own money. That's like my only two cents. Rahul, you want to go next? Yeah, I'm going to tell you guys about day one, just the straight up details. And if Andrew hears this, he might kill me. No. <laughs> um, so Andrew and I aren't working. So Andrew and I kind of decided to do this. Andrew started six months prior to me. And so between Andrew and I, we, we basically talked to customers. So it took time. We had to kind of dig into savings, all that other stuff. We talked to hundreds of customers to realize, okay, what is the basic idea of what they would want in an eight week? Back then it was eight weeks last fall. Uh, program. Um, and so we pre-sold. We actually put up a cheap website, a Wix website, and we pre-sold that first cohort. That's a great way to get a sense of will people pay for what you do. So we had a little bit of revenue and we had that revenue and then we started kind of pre-selling the second cohort. That allowed us to kind of build out a financial model to say, you know what, for four months, if we can just get a little bit of cash that gets us to this point, we basically needed a float. So one, we decided because we didn't, and also early on from a values and culture perspective, we knew we didn't really want to build that VC rocket ship for this program. If what we believe in is about personal connection and relationships, it doesn't work with 200, 300 people in a cohort. It only works with 40 or 50. And so we knew we weren't building something super scalable. So VC was out of the question. So we decided to raise debt. We decided to show people our business model, say we have this much revenue, can you give us debt? We went to friends and families who they gave us pretty favorable terms and we raised debt for six months. We amortized it over three years. So it's basically like a mortgage. We're just paying it off. So now we can understand cash flows. There's not one big tranche where we have to pay it back. So we're kind of a case in point of what we preach to a lot of our fellows. It's like build and talk to investors that have your same mindset and vision and you'll get the responses you want. If we went to this smallish view on what day one's going to be in the first year or two and went to Sequoia or some big VC, we wouldn't even get in the door. So a lot of it was a little bit of a match. And so that's what we ended up doing with investors this time around. We're now at a point a year down the road where we can have a larger and longer discussions because we've seen what's worked and now there's a lot more traction. So we're talking to more different styles and types of investors now and seeing where those conversations go. Um, so for me, I think I'm going to go back to content and context. Um, it's not, if you're all you're thinking about is raising money, you're not thinking about it on broad, broad enough terms. Um, it's not about the money. It is about the money, but it's not about the money. It's also about control, where you want to go, um, how much of yourself, because it's yourself that you're giving up, how much of yourself are you willing to sell um, in order to make that next, whatever that next period is where you need to survive. Um, you know, uh, I would suspect that for most of you, um, and I know it's true for me too, absolutely, I'm not willing to give up any control in Plum right now. So I'm not looking to raise money at all. Um, and when I do, it's going to be more what Rahul did, which is offering debt. Um, Plum has a very specific mission. And unless I get money that allows me to continue that mission, I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I can fund Plum for probably the next year and be okay. It's not, and it, it just sounds like, oh, that's a lot of money. It's not. 
it's a couple thousand dollars a month to run Plum. It's actually a pretty inexpensive operation. It's some AWS servers and some code. So it's really pretty simple. Um, so I think that when you think about raising money, you need to think about it in a larger context because there's tons of money out there and there's tons of types of money out there, but it comes down to what, what is gonna be right for you? What is gonna be the right content money to give you the right context, the right, the right momentum, the right direction? Because um, you can raise money and totally lose control of your company and be thoroughly unhappy with it. And I've seen it happen with lots of entrepreneurs. Um, and my philosophy on this, because I've been on both sides of the fence, raise as little money as you need, as little money as you can get away with. Don't, you know, unless you know, I need to hire 20 engineers and we've got this huge idea and I've already proven it and I need $10 million and I need it next week. Raise as little money as you can get away with. All you, because what you're doing is you're giving away parts of your company. For Rahul and Andrew, they're giving away some of their cash flow. Fine, easy. But you know, think about it in a larger context. How is this going to impact you? Um, for a lot of entrepreneurs, I know you're worried about making next month's rent. That's a hard situation. But don't let that really short-term tactical need influence anything in the longer term. Um, you know, you need to be able to have faith in yourself. And you need to be able to keep control over what you're building. Otherwise, you won't build what you want and you'll be thoroughly unhappy. To give anyone like I'm in my parents' basement in Ohio because I was like, I literally can't pay New York City rent if this is what I want to do with my life. Like, doesn't sound fancy or fun, but we're in this virtual world where it's okay to like remove yourself from like situations to in order to better your business. And if you could do that instead of fundraising like you are actively making that decision so you whatever you do moving forward you'll be held accountable for so there's a lot more like value and accountability that comes up with that rather than just taking money and like going with that going with it because you're not going through all the exercises that you need to go through to make like a successful business yeah and just to i think ap that's a great point and just to leverage off of that a little bit the suit earlier take money the less control you have over later money people forget that too you know you'll raise money and there'll be terms about what you can raise later that is often usurious and you know you'll give away way too much of your company this early on in order to get a little bits of money and i just think that the more you can bootstrap you know raise money when you absolutely have to but once you start don't stop it's a full-time job you know you're going to need to keep doing it um so um make make a really smart decision about when to raise money and the kind of money you're going to raise um and what your time frame is on doing it i can tell you because i've been in this world a while now and, and rahul you may have had a slightly different experience because it was more friends and family but raising money is probably a three to six month job at a minimum um you know most entrepreneurs most ceos once they're into that cycle part of their job every day is raising money that's it's a sales cycle and it's sometimes it's a long sales cycle and that's how you need to look at it when i was doing nonprofit, it took me three and a half years to close usaid and two and a half to close jp morgan so like even if it's individual even if it's fundraising fundraising is tough it's hard it's a full-time job and it's hard to take that on i mean i know we have other questions and i want to get to them but like to in, to 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 the other piece i think just to add to adam's point is um a lot of people go into entrepreneurship, like think about the reasons you've gone into entrepreneurship. For many people, it's autonomy, it's agency, it's control. The minute you take that first check, depending on who that check is from, if that check's from an uncle, you have a little more autonomy than you would if you took it from a seasoned angel investor. The minute you take that check, you basically have a boss again, and that boss determines the timeline that you have to hit the next milestones. You don't anymore. So. Just something to keep in mind. Many people go into entrepreneurship for certain reasons. The minute you take that first check without knowing it, you're giving a lot of that stuff back to somebody else. And just to add on what Rafool said, sorry, I know I'm being really talkative. Google is Google today because they did that, by the way. Google is this pernicious company today because they went with the VC plan. They decided they were going to go for hyper growth. And in order to sustain that, they put all of the stuff in place that we don't like about them. So. Take that as a as a moral lesson, you know, 
you buy into that, you have to buy into that whole hog. So you need to think about what it is you're willing to sell your soul for. Thank you everyone for your amazing insights. Um, so we'd like to dive into the questions from the audience. Um, first of all, with the RSVP questions. Um, the first one is uh, rather specific, but do you have any tips for someone working on a startup without a tech co-founder? Learn some technology, <laughs> really. Um, it's too easy to get taken advantage of if you get a co-founder who knows something that you know absolutely nothing about. And as the CEO of the company, you have no business not understanding any of your company. Or particularly if you're running a technology company, as the CEO, you have no business not understanding even the basics of the technology. I had a CEO pitch to me the other day who didn't know whether he was using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Did he get an investment? Probably not, <laughs> by the sounds of it. Um, I also like, I don't have a tech background at all whatsoever. Um, and I think that in my head, every company is a tech company because like, if you don't like at this day and age, like you're probably using technology to get somewhere to scale. Um, so I think that what I, when I first started Museo, I was like, oh my God, I have to invest all this money into this tech platform. Like, oh, like, what is it going to be? What is it going to do? But it was kind of like, learn going as far as you can sort of without that technology piece so that when that technology piece fits in it makes more sense and you know why you're doing it and then you kind of are able to lead it a little bit better instead of it just going back and forth and like just like you're telling them to build something that you don't know what you're building they don't know what you're building and it's like because you're still figuring it out as they're figuring it out and like you really want to go as far as you can without adding that tech piece in so that you are fully know the ins and outs of what you're trying to build um, yeah, to, I think to Adam's point, if you want to be a founder and CEO, you have to be dangerous enough in every element of your business, not just what it is today, but what it's going to be down the road. So be dangerous enough to kind of at least basically understand coding. There's all kinds of no code tools out there that you can learn. You got to push and drive yourself because there is a nightmare scenario to every tech connection. <laughs> nightmare scenario for CTO is that they want half the company, they want equity, they want all these, they'll be super expensive now because you don't have a valuation. You're just an idea. And for them to come in with a heavy title like CE, CTO, you don't even know them that well. You need, you know, you haven't dated long enough and they could be very expensive. That's the nightmare scenario there. You hire somebody who's expensive, who's a product expert. They're only a product expert. They're not committed to the mission and the problem. So they're going to be asking you, just like AP said, all these random questions that you're kind of like, I don't know what the answer is. You have talked to 500 people, so you know that they want this. It doesn't look as nice. You're trying to build an MVP. The product person, because they take pride in what they're building, will be embarrassed by an MVP. That's not a good fit. You can go out and hire a dev shop, but there's tons of nightmare stories where those people hold you hostage, right? They'll make it. They own the code. You want them to change something. There's a falling out. Next thing you know, they own the code. You never see it. Now you've lost all that work and money. So learn enough where you can kind of understand and be dangerous yourself. At the earliest stages, MVP means minimal viable for a reason. It doesn't have to look nice. doesn't have to look beautiful. Just make it have utility for the people whose problem you're trying to solve. Later on, when you get traction, those tech questions become easier to solve because you have a little bit of a roadmap that you've gone down already. And, and I would just build on that as well. Like there are so many great tools available now that allow pretty much anybody to become a tech co-founder, you know, like all of the no code stuff that's out there, um, Bubble, Webflow, um, and then obviously all of the pre-existing platforms as well. Yeah, there's, there's really no reason why anybody can't try building something. So in the same way that like, sometimes it's really easy to get stuck into your head and like get stuck in like negative self talk. I think technology has this fear factor around it too. When people are like, Oh my God, I can't do it. Whereas actually just dive in as soon as you start doing it, I think you'll realize it's a lot easier than you think it is. Um, and then you'll get like a bit of a boost from knowing that you can be a bit dangerous there too. And also ask questions of other technology people, find out what's possible, you know, what can be done. I'm still learning that for some of bits of my search engine. Steve is a wonderful 
co-founder because he's, you know, he's got the technology. We have long conversations about it. And every week I'm learning something else that I can do and something that I can't do within the bounds of the technology that's supporting the underlying Plum right now. Um, so just a caution about no code, no code tools is the code they actually put out is not really generally all that good. So if you're at a point where somebody's going to look at your code to decide to invest or buy or whatever, it's not the best thing. It's fine for prototypes, but you know, you want real code under there when, once you get to that point. Um, but ask a lot of questions, find out what's possible, find out what's not possible, find out what technology you need to underlie what you're doing and find out what the, you know, the concepts are behind that. Um, that I think is going to give you a really good foundation of understanding such that a, nobody can take advantage of you and B you kind of have a sense of what's possible and what's not. So when you come up with this idea, you can think, oh, there's not a way to do that with this. We would need to look somewhere else. Um, and I think that's a hugely important foundation. So lots of great insights. Um, we had a question here from um, Maggie, who is asking about like the role of advisory boards. And, and I think, you know, obviously advisory boards can be formal, informal, um, you see them used like in fundraising as well as um, as you're as you're really growing. So the question is for, for folks who didn't see it, you know, what is what is the role? What should the role of your advisory board be, and and how are they involved? Um, any tips on like size or um, how they're viewed through the eyes of of investors? And I think I'd also build on that as well, and um, you know, ask how you guys are using advisors as well, be they formal or informal advisors and how valuable and important they are. I don't, I'm also figuring this out. So I feel like I can tell you my journey, the journey aspect of it. Um, I think that what I'm gathering and what I've learned and kind of what I've done in a very informal way is figure out like, what are the pillars that my business like uses like do I need a psychology person who's like like a master at psychology do I need someone who's like a master at technology a master at marketing I'm like what are all the pillars that I need in order to be super successful and well-rounded and finding for me it's like multiple mentors or multiple people that I know that are just like I call it like their zone of genius like what is their zone of genius and how are how can you sort of tap into that when you have a specific problem in like a marketing area or you have a specific problem in like finance like financial models like you are going to that person with a very specific sort of need um to really tap into like something that they also are like yes I 100% know what I'm doing so you guys are not both just sitting in doubt really um and then you kind of it's like a more of a constructive um overall conversation I still don't know how to like I'm mine's so all informal so I don't know anything about like formal advisors <laughs> I think advisors are hugely helpful um, they help you fill the gaps, but first you need to identify what those gaps are. Um, you know, I'm a first time CEO, I'm 64 and a first time CEO. So there's bits of business, there's bits of the technology that I'm using that I don't understand well enough yet. So one of my guys is, I have three um, advisors, um, a total business guy, somebody who can advise me on the operational side, the financial side. He's totally a wizard in that a business development woman who is one of the strongest networks I've ever seen in the entire world. And when I'm ready, she's going to be able to connect me with a whole bunch of companies and people that are going to be able to help drive me forward. And the last guy is one of the most brilliant technologists I've ever known um, who has advised other search engine companies before. Um, so he is going to really help me tone tune the technology to make it do what we want it to do, to have Plum act the way that we envision it acting. Um, and those are my three, and that's all there's gonna be for a while because those, those fill the gaps that I see that I need. From an investment standpoint, if you don't have a full-on team that covers all of the bases that investors are gonna wanna see, advisory boards are great because they can help you, again, fill those gaps. Um, and that's how I would use them. Don't offer them a lot of equity. A little bit is fine. I think I 
my investors got half a percent each. Um, so don't offer them a huge amount of, of equity if they're not going to be actively working in the operational side and the development side of the business. They're advisors. They're not operators. So they shouldn't get a lot and they should be very, very aligned with your vision of what you want to do um, and have huge intelligence in those gaps or huge networks in those gaps where you need them. So I'd say the, the most important part for me in deciding what advisors to get are understanding yourself and looking at where your gaps are and then finding advisors that can help you fill those. So everything Adam and AP said about who to look for, I'm not going to go into that anymore, but how to engage people. Um, again, look, advisors can be, I don't want to say predatory, but they can take advantage of you. So red flags, anybody who wants a formal title too early, anybody who wants points too early, anybody who thinks angels who think they're writing a check, which automatically puts them as an advisor in a formal capacity, red flag, because advisors need to be strategic. They need to help you. Money's great, but like those are two very different functions of what they do. So any sort of red flag of somebody who wants to go formal too early is something to look out for. Stay, stick with informal as long as you can, because what it, it's a test that these people are invested in you and the mission of what you're building. Any other thing kind of you got to think about a little bit like really what's the intentions here. My suggestion, start with just calls. Be like, hey, would you be willing to hop on the video call with me for an hour a month? See if that goes up to two hours a month. Try that for three to six months. Are they actually helpful? Are they actually open to giving you time? Test them out. Let them do all that stuff before it even becomes an informal invitation. Do the informal thing as long. And formal is probably when you're getting close to raising that first round with a deck where people want to see the team around you, right? They serve a very functional purpose because if you're raising your first round from anybody, you're not paying anyone. You're probably not paying yourself, so you don't have a team that advisory board ends up being that team, um, that team on that team slide. So engage with people early and often. Don't reach out to people a month before you want to fundraise and be like, will you be an advisor? So again, it goes back to my kind of North Star of like build meaningful, genuine relationships, have people help you and get on the journey before you need something from them. And don't pretend that people are on your advisory board and they're not, because like no. people do that and then somebody goes and talks and they say hey i see that you're working with such and such company and they're like i have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> and then all of your credibility has completely gone through the the floor so like i know it's probably tempting to do that sometimes um especially if you think it's somebody obscure enough but like it will come back and bite you in the bum so so don't do that yeah or other places that are equally uncomfortable um so what you said tori and what rahul did, said actually made me think of this thing that's kind of like a life philosophy for me right now and it's absolutely true in business anytime you're being inauthentic you're causing yourself problems that's true in your personal lives but it's absolutely true in business anytime you're doing anything that's not authentic to yourself it's going to come back and as tori said bite you in the bum and just a quick add to that like attracts like so if that's who you are, you're going to attract people like that as well. Yeah, if you're being inauthentic, you're going to attract other inauthentic people, and then you are got a quagmire. That's exactly right, Rahul. Uh, who's off the next question? We're having a little break. I, I can ask the next question. Um, so... Um, what um are there any specific books i mean we, there was some chat about um the mum test and like lean startups are there any books that you would recommend uh, people read or that you just found really insightful two of them um beyond entrepreneurship there's a new version out great book get it read it um and then a book i personally found um, life altering is thinking fast and slow by Daniel Kahneman. Totally changed the way I approach markets, businesses, everything. Was there anything in particular that stood out to you from those about books? Mm -hmm. um, it, ways of thinking about how humans act and think and feel. Um, hugely, both of them were responsible for huge increases of my EQ and my. BQ, my business quotient, 
Um, you know, um, thinking fast and slow in particular is, I mean, Daniel Kahneman's still alive and you can actually talk to him. He's the, he's the father of behavioral economics and he's just an amazingly brilliant man. Um, and what he did fundamentally changed how people look at economics and how people look at business. It's a hugely, I think, important book for any entrepreneur to read. It, it's amazingly insightful and caused me, like I said, to completely alter the way I think about business, the way I think about marketing in particular. I have a really hard time reading books, but I, so like if I can get through a book, it a lot. so definitely think when I was super confused, the Lean Startup was really, really helpful in just like breaking down concepts. Um, but one that I'm reading right now is um, Ego is the Enemy. Um, by Ryan Holiday, because I'm having this like outer body experience this year about like attaching my ego, like where my ego is type of thing um, in my personal life, but as also really translated to business because my ego is super attached to the solution rather than the problem, which is like a huge, pro is an issue in itself. Um, so I think just kind of like where you're sort of like for me, it's all just about where I'm putting my energy and where am I putting my thought? Because like, we all have a gas tank and like, it's true, we're human, we have a gas tank and like where we use that fuel is like super important. So that book's been like, I'm working on it and I feel like I'm getting good vibes from it. So I suggest that book for anyone who's maybe going through that experience. Um, I got a bunch here. So I'm just gonna, good thing this is recorded. Um, um, so for business stuff, like there's a lot of business stuff out there. Like it's kind of some of the cult around business books kind of turns me off, but zero to one's good. Lean startup is good. Um, a good book that is part business story and part entertainment is Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Um, there's a lot of privilege that our buddy Phil had growing up. So kind of take it with a grain of salt, but you know, it's kind of the original story of somebody bootstrapping in the late 70s and 80s and selling shoes from Japan on the West Coast. And so it's a funny, entertaining book. Shoe Dog's a good one. Um, the book that I read that got me out of philanthropy because it encapsulated everything I thought and felt that was broken in it um, is called Winners Take All. Um, it's a great book that talks about this idea that private equity funds can go out and put a billion dollars of people out of business then turn around and write a $100 million check and end up sitting on the boards of these NGOs that are designed to solve the problems they created in the first place. Um, I felt a lot of that. And so it's a really good book that talks about that. And two books um, that kind of talk about tailwinds and kind of macro level thoughts on views and humanity and what the future looks like um, is Harari's um, Sapiens and Homo Deus, mm. kind of back to back. They're, they're pretty good books. They're very big books, but they ended up being pretty quick reads for me, like a day and a half. So. There's a bunch in there. And, and, and let me just add one more. It's one of my personal favorites just because of my mental health issues. Hyperbole and a half. It's about overcoming depression. And it's the, the funniest book I've ever read. Wow. And on that basis, we clearly have to go and read it because that's not something that you hear <laughs> said every day about those two topics. <laughs> Um, thank you. That was that was great. I think um, Ono, are you yes. asking the last question? I, I have one uh, last question from our audience, and it's actually also one that interests me personally very much. Um, do you recommend mentors? And if you do, I think Andrew, you it was you who asked this. Um, and should young entrepreneurs go about, or how should you, they go about finding one? Um, I think it's, I mean, for me personally, it's a very elementary question at the moment because I have someone that I'm talking to and I'm not sure even how to approach that person and say, hey, I like you very much. Please be my mentor, <laughs> especially when they're very senior and uh, it feels sometimes like a step up too far. <laughs> yeah, by the way, no. Well, I'll start because this will be my one day one sales pitch. I promised myself I wouldn't do a day one sales pitch, but um, so mentors, yes, 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 yes. Like in my book, mentors, advisors are the same thing. So yes, um, yes, yesterday, right? Um, how do you find them? Uh, communities like day one, honestly, like folks in our cohorts are meeting four or five people a week that might be great fits, might not be great fits, but ultimately an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. And you'd be surprised an entrepreneur who sold cupcakes might have in common with an entrepreneur who sells space software. Like 
the journeys are similar kind of across the board. And there's a piece that we talk about at day one about building in public, this idea where you don't have to share your solution, but part of being an entrepreneur, part of being a future founder CEO is building your brand and understanding that the space needs to look at you and recognize you as somebody who's committed to the problem. So, uh, oh no, to your question, like this person is not too big, but crafting what that initial email or outreach is going to look like is really important. So you can say, hey, I really admired your work. I'm also passionate about blank. This is a little bit about my background. Um, I'm really interested in the intersection of blank and blank and why other companies haven't been able to solve this problem. Would you have 15 minutes to hop on the phone um, and answer a couple of questions that I, you know, I'd like to pick your brain on whatever. Ultimately, people that are super successful, some part of them, whether it's altruistic or not, want to give back and pay it forward. So if you put it out there in the universe, whether it's a direct email to this person or LinkedIn message, give them options. Be like, if 15 minutes is too much, would you mind if I email you five questions? Give them a bunch of ways where they can't say no. The next iteration of that is taking that and putting it out on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever, and actually letting serendipity tell you who's going to respond to that. You'd be surprised if you consistently do that over time in the course of weeks and months, the number of people that might end up being mentors that you've never really known before. So, um, Ono, it, it sounds like you know this person already. Uh, yeah, I do. I know them. And it's also there's also the personal element because I also knew them personally before I even was interested in their um, professional uh, knowledge and uh, standing, but that makes it even more complex sometimes because suddenly you want something on the very other field from them. So I have learned that as long as I speak my truth kindly, nobody can fuck with me. So you know this guy already. Tell him you respect him. You're, you know, you like, you're looking for a mentor. You really respect him. You want him to be in that role for you. Would he consider it? And then add on to that a bunch of the things that Rahul just said. This is what I'm thinking about. This is how I want to do it. But be authentic, be kind, be respectful. And he might say no, but I think Rahul is right. And his other thing, once, once people get to a certain point in life, they enjoy, they prize being able to give back to the community and being a mentor is a great way to do it. I've had a bunch of mentees in the past couple of years. Um, and I will tell you from the other side, it's one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. And I probably learn at least as much as they do. So there's, it's hugely uh, enlightened self-interest for me to take on a mentee. And, you know, you have to be respectful of their time and yada, yada, but, you know, be, just go ask them, go talk to them about it. Um, have, be bold, have no reservations. Um, you know, you're a smart guy, you're here. Um, you know, you may feel like an imposter, but what the hell? Um, you know, again, I really respect you. I really like your, what you do. I really respect your professional. I'd like your help, yada, yada. Be kind, be authentic. Nobody can fuck with you. Oh no, I've I've had uh, my mentor I've known personally, and then I, you know, transitioned more into like a mentorship role, and they like it. They like it. So like, don't feel like you know they were kind of like, wow, I didn't think that you thought of me in that way, you know, type of deal. And then so they, you know, they're more insightful because they also know you personally, so they know when you're being like a nut kind of, and you're like, no, <laughs> calm down, like you know, I know what your brain is going through right now. You know what I mean? So there are yeah, that's awesome. um, advantages to that. And um, I, I will just say one quick thing about mentors is that everyone has an opinion and, and sometimes you'll get clashing opinions from different mentors. And this is where your sort of intuition and your you know, conviction that you have sort of comes into play where maybe one mentor is clashing with the other, but you take it from a lens of curiosity and challenge the point rather than just being like, well, this person's told me to do this and this person's told me to do this and I don't know what to do. And like, everyone has an opinion. People are there to give you their opinions. That's a, you know, that's a part of it, but you and you still need to like, you kind of have to like mentor yourself in a way. You kind of have to just be like, okay, one second, like, what do I truly believe in taking all the information um, and don't just like be like pushed around by so many different people. Can I say, can I add one thing, Tori? I know we're at time. So go, go for it. just one thing is I'll tell you guys what not to do. Like don't on the outreach, be specific enough and don't be super long, but don't be vague. 
Don't just be like, can I grab 30 minutes with you? Or can you, I'd like to pick your brain on blank. Like these people are busy also. Like if they're any level of successful, they're busy. They don't have time to just randomly guess. Like, I wonder what this, give them enough to where they know if they grab 15, 30 minutes with you, how they can know what that 30 minutes is going to be about. They can prepare for it and they can give you the answers you want. So this random, like in the first couple of cohorts of day one, people would reach out to these mentors and be like, Hey, I'd love to get on your calendar. Here's my link. And it's like, dude, no one's ever going to respond to you. So like be specific enough, but just don't do a random vague, you know, I want to pick your brain on blank. Thank you guys. Very, very motivating. Thank you. And actually just one final tip for me on that one. I was talking like, firstly, sign up for lunch club if you haven't already, because that's my new thing for networking and I love it. Um, and I was talking to somebody on there yesterday and he said he's just met loads of people um, to help him mentor. And, and a mentor doesn't have to have a formal title. You know, you can learn so much from people in just like one on one conversations that maybe they'll happen again. And hopefully if you're um, open enough and, and you have a meaningful enough conversation, they will. But like, don't force it. It doesn't have to have a title. Um, so that would be my my takeaway there. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much to our fantastic panelists, um, AP, Rahul and Adam for joining us today. It's, this has been great. It really has been like just a conversation amongst friends and um, I hope you've enjoyed it. If people want to like stay in touch or like follow you on social media, what's the best way for them to, to do that or, or sign up for day one? You know, what's the best way for people to find to find you guys? Well, Feel of course, free. the best way to go, for go ahead, Rahul. Oh, yeah. Go to plum.one and look up our names and then see what no. um, <laughs> plum one and go sign up. Yeah. Um, my LinkedIn and email, if there's any follow up, just feel free to share that far and wide. Email address at day one and also my LinkedIn. Please reach out. We'd love to meet all of you. Yeah. And I am Adam at plum.one. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. Reach out to me by email. Let me know where you came from. I'm happy to talk. I'm at denimrush.com and all y'all better follow Denimrush on Instagram because we're growing and I would love for you guys to be part of our journey. Uh, we will certainly do that. So we will share around uh, email addresses and um, yeah, go go make some new friends on LinkedIn. I think that's just a nice courtesy as well. Um, when Adam said, you know, tell me how you how you found me, like how you know me, like that's really nice because then it shows that. You know, you're not just one of a, a crowd of people doing like cold outreach. You've actually got some sort of relationship. So I would recommend that in, in every situation. Well, thank yeah, you again. Yeah, on LinkedIn especially, there's so much crap that if I don't know where you're from, I'm lucky to ignore you. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you again. We are going to be posting this on YouTube. So uh, you'll be able to go and find all of those book recommendations again. And yeah, any questions, uh, you know, uh, you know where we are. You can you can put them in our WhatsApp group as well. So thanks a lot, and we will see you at the next event very soon. Thank you. Pleasure, everybody. Bye. 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 Take care.